do is like popcorn to everybody and have you all introduce yourself and I don't know maybe what you're enjoying learning. Um, then perhaps you can call on the next person um, and we'll see if we can get through. June, I'm gonna help ask you to help make sure we get to everybody and somebody doesn't get left off. Left off. So I'm gonna go to um, somebody I can see in my screen. And so I am gonna ask Dylan to unmute and introduce and then call somebody else. All right. Hi, everybody. Um, my name is Dylan Lesniak. I'm uh, originally from Florida. Um, been out in Portland uh, since 2019. Yeah, November of 2019, so right at the end. Um, I joined the PDX Code Guild and uh, graduated from that back in April. And uh, since then, I've been working on projects and studying, doing uh, algorithms, data structures, this and that. Uh, aside from that, looking to hopefully get a job in a, probably some like full stack position, but honestly, I'm open to anything. Um, as for maybe more like hobbies and whatever, uh, video games, of course, um, and music, video games, music, and um, I also like studying Japanese a lot. So those are my, those are my three biggies. Um, yeah, I think that, that about covers who I am. Um, nice to meet you, Kara. Very well um, rounded. Now you get to pick on a classmate. Sure. All right. Let's do. Uh, let's see. John. Uh, John Fial. I think uh, seen you once or twice in the past. How about uh, rock and soft? Thanks, uh, Dylan. Sure. So uh, my name is John Fial. Uh, I'm originally born and raised in Hawaii. Um, I joined the military, so I'm here with uh, Vet Tech in PDX Code Guild. Uh, our class is probably about. I think five people I saw in the, in the group right now are from our class. We are finishing up next week. Uh, and so we're starting to do more of the looking for work and polish up our resumes and apply for tech jobs. Um, after I got out of the military, I got a master's in biology. Um, I met my wife in South America, so I don't know Spanish. Uh, we have a two-year-old, which is where I'm doing my, uh, my final project as a little HTML5 um, canvas drawing board kind of uh, going through some big philosophical debates right now about what I want that to be for uh, for him to try to get him more addicted or just try to have him learn uh, letters on the keyboard or something. Uh, so lots of lots of thinking about that the last week. And I'm happy to be here. So thanks, uh, thanks, Kara, for doing this. And um, I picked the next person, uh, Billy, on my screen. It's June, John, and then, uh, and then Billy's next. Okay, thank you, John. Uh, Billy, I uh, took the full stack course and the that's course last year. Originally from Alabama, I spent uh, 20 years in the US Navy. I retired a couple years ago. I have no prior coding experience, but I've enjoyed learning it. I love the uh, creativity that you can employ to solve some of the problems. Um, possibly, uh, like to enter uh, academia. So right now I'm in a NYU uh, prep course for grad school for computer science, possibly bioinformatics. We'll see how that goes. And otherwise, I uh, enjoy cooking, eating, and still working on growing my uh, afro. So, so far, so good. And that's about it. Billy, before you call on somebody, I got to ask you a really, really important question that's not meant to be alienating to anybody else on the call, but can totally set the tone. Are you or are you not a University of Alabama football fan? I actually went to Auburn University, so yes! you? that's the right answer. That's the right answer. <laughs> I agree. You went to Auburn also? I went to the University of Georgia. But a bunch of my friends went to Auburn and I just basically learned that Alabama was like the like school you go boo hiss at. And so um, I was uh, it's, SEC fans. We're crazy. Like oh. it's, it's the thing. <laughs> I see you're even wearing the school colors now. So yeah, I'm wearing, I'm wearing my red and black. So I had to ask. All right. You can call on the next person. But it's really important to me. I'm, I'm glad you went to the right school. Yes, I as well. Okay, uh, let's go with uh, Ron over there. Ron. Hey, good afternoon, everybody. My name is uh, Ron Mancilli. 
Uh, I retired in uh, 2016 from about 28 years in the Navy. Um, did my undergrad at San Diego State uh, in information systems. I uh, actually did a lot of technology and development uh, or research and development for the Navy uh, in the early 90s or late 90s as the HTML boom was happening. Uh, so it was pretty cool stuff. Um, kind of got out of it, uh, went uh, into aviation, uh, but I still dabbled a lot in um, a lot of computer uh, projects and stuff like that. Um, and then uh, after my retirement, I thought uh, I'd go back to school again. And uh, I got my MBA over at Portland State, which was really cool, uh, super cool. Uh, met a lot of really cool people. Um, and, then, uh, and then I got to this point and I'm, I'm kind of looking um, to go into project management and uh, specifically with uh, software development and maybe software engineering. So this is really cool. One is, is I got to catch up on all the technologies. That's kind of what's happening around. Um, uh, and then, um, and then just getting to do this, an opportunity to do a really cool project. So I have a little bit of a, a passion for the housing crisis that's occurring around Portland and around big cities. So I got a kind of a cool project that I think is going to hopefully, uh, I'll finish next week with my capstone, uh, with the rest of my, uh, teammates. So, uh, we'll see how that goes. Uh, that's me. Awesome. Who's next? Ooh, I'm gonna go pick on my classmates too. Austin, go ahead, you're up. Thanks. Um, so I'm also a Navy, um, or was, Navy veteran. Um, and I recently completed my PhD in anthropology. So I'm a, a language teacher at the moment. Um, you know, it could be anthropology or digital humanities in the future. Digital humanities is just exploding in academia. So, you know, I'm looking for ways either in my own teaching to make my own materials. So I'm making an interactive Russian textbook for my, for my capstone or um, to branch out and kind of do more development work for, for larger projects in digital humanities. That is awesome. Who's next? <laughs> um, someone, how about someone that I don't know? Um, uh, Lawrence? Awesome. You caught the cue. You caught the cue. Hey, uh, so I'm Lawrence. Um, I, I'm originally from Washington, D.C. Um, I spent most of my formative years in Georgia, though. Uh, went into the Air Force for a good few years. Decided it was time to call it quits and um, decided to actually follow my passion, which was, you know, working on anything having to do with computers. So I was like, you know what? I liked how some of the games that I used to play before, I used to play like really obscure games. And I liked how people were able to go into the code behind them and actually meld them into the things that we play today. And so I said, you know what, let me get into that. And that's how I found myself in, uh, in the, what was it? I was in the day class for, um, it was the beginning half of 2020. I was in the same class Billy was in, you know, we smashed it, got through there. And uh, yeah, it was pretty amazing. Um, and now uh, I'm in another coding boot camp, just continuing to build on that foundation. And it's been going pretty good so far. Um, I've also been taking the time to branch out because I've been learning JavaScript, Python, and on my own time, I go and look a little bit into C++ because I see that's where um, a lot of games that I usually play get built off of. Um, so yeah, that's that's me. And I just pop in here, you know, from time to time, see how everything's going. Awesome. Who are you going to call on, Lawrence? Ooh, let go. Let's go for Jason. Oh, well, hi. How's it going? I'm Jason. I'm like halfway through the uh, court, the full stack course right now. We're doing Django, and I have an IT background, just doing system administration. I was just really passionate about that, so I'm moving it into the coding world by going through this boot camp here wanted to branch out and meet some people yeah 
I love it. Meeting people in this flat two dimensional world is so stimulating, isn't it? Uh, <laughs> oh, yes. We get so many opportunities with the current restrictions and everything going on. <laughs> Who would you like to call on? Oh, that's right. Dustin, you're up. I've seen you before. All right. Um, Dustin DeShane, another six year Navy vet. Um, I've been through the full stack course, the advanced course here. Um, I'm currently a TA for the Code Guild. Um, my hobbies tend to revolve around video games, reading, a lot of sedentary lifestyle kind of things. Um, but I do like to play disc golf and um, play at being a photographer um, whenever it's not pouring down rain outside because I'm not that interested in being wet all the time, which makes living here kind of strange. Um, yeah, that's me in a nutshell. Uh, you say, Dustin, before you call on someone, I'm not sure how far you've gone afoot looking for disc golf, but there is disc golf at Shampooey Park down by Salem. And there's also a disc golf course at Stubb Stewart on 26. <laughs> there's a, there's 72 courses within an hour and a half drive from me. That is amazing. All right, who are you calling on? Uh, Jasmine, I guess. Thanks for that. No, I'm just kidding. Um, I'm Jasmine. I, let's see, I'm born and raised here. I went to Portland State, got a bachelor's in communication studies with the intentions of doing public relations, then pan out for like four years looking for a, some sort of job. So I late joined the Navy. So I spent four years on active duty doing things I can't talk about. <clears throat> um, so that active duty life was not for me. So I transferred to the reserves and that's what I'm clean, currently doing, doing things that I still can't talk about. Um, went through the full stack development course from June to September of 2020. Got out doing that. Now I'm just over here trying to find work in my free time. I'm a photographer, so I'm also trying to build a business doing that which actually it was great because my capstone, I focused on building my photography website. So now I'm just trying to get it all together and working. So if anyone, I'm gonna plug myself really quick. If anybody needs a photo shoot, that'd be awesome. Um, yeah, uh, other than that, I just started running. So I'm on week three and I've been running about three or four times a week. So I'm pretty proud of myself because I absolutely hate it. And I'm also a mom, so that's a full time in itself. Very impressive. Um, I run a lot and I still hate it, so don't think that that will change <laughs> with, <laughs> with time. And great for my headaches, though. So I mean, it's nice to be out. Nice to be outside. Um, I think we have two people that haven't been called on: Peter and Joe. Um, I guess I'll go then. Um, my name is uh, Peter. I'm also a six-year Navy vet. Um, after I got out, I decided to get on um, pursuit of bachelor's in uh, nuclear energy. And I was like pretty set on entering that field. Um, but like towards the end of my degree, I kind of like, you know, did some soul searching and uh, found out I really like coding. So um, I found out about the vet tech program and enrolled in, you know, BDX Cogill and I'm in the same class as a lot of the people here. So we're about to finish our capstones and yeah, I'll be um, trying to find a software engineering job afterwards. That's about it for me. Awesome. Um, and Joe? Best for last. Um, yeah, I'm Joe Omley. Uh, I'm in the uh, current doing, currently doing the full stack. Uh, full stack class uh, working on my capstone right now. Uh, hoping to do the advanced course after this at some point. Uh, another, I was also in the Navy six years. Uh, I was a Korean linguist, uh, got out. And um, at that point, it was pretty easy for me to get a, a degree in East Asian studies with all my language credits. Uh, so I did that and then kind of decided late that I probably actually didn't want to do anything with that. Um, did a bunch of odd jobs since then. I was a prep cook, worked for the census. Uh, 
I was a truck driver for a year and a half and worked for like a digital marketing company. So I did, I did like a ton of stuff. And uh, I kind of always wanted to come back to this kind of community. That was something I missed from the Navy. If you were, if you were a linguist, you were kind of, uh, uh, military linguists were, they were a type. And, you know, there were kind of a lot of like-minded individuals. Um, and that's something I missed. And so that's something I'm liking about uh, getting back into coding, getting back into working around, a, you know, something that's kind of more uh, engaging with a lot of people that are, are yeah, kind of like-minded. Um, so yeah, hopefully, uh, yeah, just seeing where, where this leads me. That's awesome. Thank you. And thank y'all for doing that. Um, it's nice for me to sometimes get to meet folks and in a small group like this, this was extra nice. And I appreciate all of you that served. Thank you very much for your service. Um, I made some notes, so I'll touch on a couple things, but I was gonna share a slide deck. It's 10 slides. Um, it's basically a who I am, what I do with the association, um, and then some data trends around the, the tech industry. Um, and then I'll pop it back out and we can do more of a chat for Q&A. So my home office is not particularly well set up for doing presentations like this. So when I share my screen, I will no longer see y'all. So if your eyes are closed or if you have a question, I'm just gonna keep right on talking. <laughs> Feel free to interrupt. Um, I have a cat that's sitting right there. I can't promise that she won't walk across here. I can't promise she won't walk across the back of my chair. Um, can't promise you won't hear her. So work from home life, right? Everyone nods, I, I appreciate that. Um, I also I'm gonna drop some things in the chat for y'all. So um, I'm gonna just hit present. So here's the beginning of our 10 slide deck. As Jean mentioned, I'm Kara Snow. I work for the Technology Association of Oregon. And um, this does look a little juvenile. I actually took this slide from a presentation I gave for high schoolers in Missouri. Um, the beauty of tech this year is we've been able to present around the world about what we do in Portland. So I think it's pretty cool. Um, I've actually been in high tech for 20 years. I sort of landed in it. I went to the University of Georgia. Um, I have a degree in education. And then I wound up in tech recruiting at a small software company that was bootstrapped. Um, they were intrigued that I that I was smart and so I learned quality assurance testing and doing things with ETL migration long before the term data analyst came into vogue um, and spent almost 10 years doing that work. Um, I've worked for an infrastructure company and then I worked for a second startup before I moved into the tech association um, world. So I always tell people I've worked in lots of different tech jobs or tech adjacent jobs. And then um, I really like to read, run, and cook. And I have a teeny tiny dog. Notice the cat does not get a mention because she's generally here. The dog is too adorable, but he is asleep. He contributes nothing to the bottom line around here. Um, so I work at the Technology Association of Oregon. You all are members by extension of being in the PDX Code Guild classes and being an alum until you find a job. So we are a uh, trade association who are tasked with creating an inclusive world-class innovation economy in Oregon and Southwest Washington that strengthens our regional tech industry. I think the pandemic has changed that a little bit in the fact that tech is now adjacent to so many of the industries that are here. Um, and we're working a lot with our agricultural partners and our manufacturing partners who are looking for folks that have tech skill sets. Um, you know, Lawrence, you mentioned about gaming. Um, there are some organizations around here that are doing VR and, and AR for uh, construction um, purposes and for manufacturing facilities to teach um, different training modules. And so I think gaming could go even beyond just working for a game organization. So we're the force behind the regional tech industry. Um, we offer networks, which are like actual small communities, um, events, all online, advocacy initiatives, industry development, marketing and promotion, talent development, and a whole variety of other resources. Um, at the end, I'll, I'll share some that are really specific to y'all, but we basically represent 500 
ish companies around Oregon and Southwest Washington who are tech companies. So like producers of tech, um, tech enabled companies. So like Kroger's IT department or Nike um, and then tech service providers, which are staffing organizations, um, accountants, lawyers, et cetera. It's about 50,000 people in our ecosystem. Last year we hosted 130-ish events online. Um, we had about 8,000 folks join us. Um, and we really are the community that puts tech first. And we also um, hear all the time about folks needing talent and to hire. So, oh, I kind of went through our stats already. I forgot that I had put these in here. Um, we actually have offices in Eugene and Bend. Who has an office anymore? Um, but we do support the entire state. So um, if there are job opportunities outside of the Portland metro area, we often can find those and source those and help folks that are interested in um, those opportunities. And then this slide may be hard to see, but um, industry development just basically means that we are the voice of tech for everything. So like this afternoon, I'm doing a video with um, Greater Portland Inc. from an economic development standpoint to share with international organizations why the tech sector is so great here in Portland and why they should consider opening companies here. And like my number one reason is for folks like y'all because we have really great talent. Um, our advocacy initiatives are really how do we make um, policy that's good for the tech businesses, but also good for talent development. Um, I personally spend a lot of time in K through 12 and um, with our co-school partners and our community colleges and our universities, um, helping to share like what's relevant to industry so that when you're coming out and looking for these jobs, there's some good um, intersections there. Um, professional networks and labs, I'm going to invite y'all to attend some of our events um, where you can meet people who are hiring. We do hiring specific events too, but we're starting to do some more one on ones so you can build networks like you used to do by going to things, but from the comfort of your home. Um, talent development is everything we do that's related to our K through 12 initiatives, but also to hiring today. Um, we are about to deploy a job board because we know folks are hiring and we want the people in our ecosystem to be seeing those jobs. So be on the lookout. I'm gonna drop a link in where y'all can sign up for our newsletter so you'll be able to access that. Um, and then marketing and promotion, like that's really important for a lot of um, companies that are trying to hire, but also to do business. And like June sent the thing to y'all or Will about Hack Oregon, um, like we're marketing their event because we have a pretty big reach um, statewide. Um, so I'm not sure if y'all have heard or seen this. Uh, this is the K-shaped recovery that we are going to be coming out of from the pandemic where um, industries like tech, software, retail are going to be doing really well and the industries that are going to continue to struggle, um, it appears, are travel, entertainment, hospitality, food service. So the positive news is that there were almost 400,000 jobs for tech open in December nationally. And 44% of those were, I think IT staff is more like the hardware and infrastructure side, um, software developers and project managers. So that is a good chunk. Um, other roles would be sales, marketing, accounting, operations, customer success. Um, those are all credited as tech jobs. The trend for 2021 will be for the tech jobs to go up. And from a salary perspective, the only place where salaries decreased from the tech sector was in um, middle management, but everything else saw a slight increase even in this time of um, economic distress. So I couldn't find exactly how many jobs there were um, in Oregon but I do have a couple of Oregon job trends. So we track these on an annual basis. So this is um, the top five jobs um, and their yearly average wage for 2020. So if, if you're not familiar with the history of Portland, we're a huge semiconductor 
um, producer just because of Intel being uh, headquartered here. And then there are a ton of uh, device related businesses that sprung up around that ecosystem. So you can see it's almost 30,000 employees, very high wage. Um, then it becomes software publishers. And then all of the folks that do anything from a, a telecom perspective, um, custom computer programming. So that could be you writing software at a hospital versus um, being at a software company like New Relic. Um, and then system design services as well. And you can see that um, they're all pretty well paying. Um, and again, like that did not come down at all during 2020. Um, it rose by about 4%, which has been consistent um, for tech salary rises over the last 10 years. Um, I like to show this. It doesn't have a great label on it, but this is the number of firms that are tech companies that are in the state of Oregon. So you can see that in 2000, like right after the bubble burst, um, it was between 2,500 and 3,000, it stayed pretty consistent, grew up through the recession, there was a slight dip, and then it has been rising steadily through 2018. Um, that little dip that you see in 2017 is actually related to a lot of acquisitions. Um, Portland companies get acquired and then when the headquarters leaves, we don't count it as here anymore. But you can see at the end of 2018, there were over 5,500 tech firms in the state, which is a huge number when you're talking about employability. And then we started tracking this because of what I was mentioning earlier about the opportunity to do tech in various um, industry sectors. And so these are the industries that hire in tech. And I think it's really interesting that less than 25% are what's considered professional scientific and technical services. So those would be the software publishers, um, <clears throat> the, the um, consulting agencies, et cetera. It is really intriguing to me that number two is manufacturing, but it makes sense. Oregon is a pretty manufacturing heavy state. I think you will continue to see manufacturers be a huge hire of tech talent over the course of the next five to 10 years. Um, government is really, really, really interesting. Um, the state of Oregon is generally the largest purchaser of tech in the entire state, even when you look at private sector. And so they have a, a huge amount of um, job openings and they struggle to fill them. Um, and then you see kind of some, some smaller um, industry sectors. Like I like to look at this stuff, like in particular finance and insurance and healthcare and social assistance really intrigue me. Um, I think that you're gonna see a whole move towards digital health and a lot more FinTech. And it will be interesting to me if those industry sectors don't start hiring more folks from a tech perspective. And then we look at a couple of specific talent areas. So we, we looked at cyber because again, we thought it was really interesting that it's, um, you know, it's just over a thousand people, but I have heard that there are up to 2,500 more job openings from a cyber standpoint. Um, you can see professional scientific technical services over 25%, but still not huge. Um, you add management and, and um, enterprise companies and that gets you closer to 50%, which what you would assume. Um, but areas that could probably use a little support from a cyber standpoint, like government and manufacturing, again, like huge opportunities, healthcare as well. I think we've all seen the hacks um, that have happened over the last couple of years. So I know the cyber workforce in um, Oregon is desperately trying to attract talent. So while it may not be what you are interested in, you can spread that word. And then we looked at data science too. Um, Data science jobs were really interesting. There was like a huge amount of layoff at the very beginning of the pandemic um, for data science folks, they're expensive, but then it came roaring back as more and more data was being generated from all of our work from home life. Um, and we're doing so much online. So again, like not, there's one large um, employer which is management companies and enterprise. And then outside of that, um, it's, it's pretty small um, across the state. And so another opportunity, um, I can't remember who it was that was maybe looking about going and doing something with informatics. It might've been Billy, but um, 
huge opportunity here. Um, huge, huge, huge. And then that's my little dog in a bag. He's really cute. And I'm going to stop sharing, even though he's so adorable and see if y'all have questions, comments, thoughts. Actually, I'm not done. I wanted to go into two more things. Ron, there is an organization that uh, spun up last year that is doing tech specifically around houselessness in the state. I can't remember the name of the organization, but I'm going to drop my email in the chat and I can look it up. And then Austin, I was going to say from an anthropology standpoint, um, a lot of big organizations right now, um, particularly Amazon, AWS, Google, Microsoft, Facebook, are hiring uh, tech savvy anthropologists onto their product teams um, because they are realizing that the coded bias of predominantly white men, uh, sorry, sorry, white guys, um, leading uh, tech development is probably not the best approach. So anthropologists and sociologists, and I would even venture to say probably Joe, some linguists are really being recruited into these larger companies as um, specialty roles to support product development cycles. So now I really will pause for a second and see if there's any questions, comments, or thoughts. I have a question. Yeah, absolutely. I'm coming from, um, I'm a CT. And then I was CT in the Navy, so I'm pretty sure Joe knows what that is because he was a CTI. Um, but I know it's a big trend because I really want to get into the government side as far as like the intelligence community goes. Yeah. But also I still like the development side, like the front end. But I'm looking into like some of the cybersecurity certificates because they're huge hits. I've even seen them a lot with job postings for um, just other stuff. Is that something that I should be looking further into or should I just not? even look into it until later and see if there's like a company that would pay for these like thousand dollar certificates? I mean, that's a really good question. And I can tell you, um, I have a relationship with the, the, F the FBI cyber team based here in the Northwest. And like recruiting is so hard right now for some of those roles that I, I personally would wait and let somebody else pay for that for you. Um, I think it's been twice in the last 12 months that Oregon's health and human services databases have been hacked. Um, so uh, anybody that has the aptitude, I'm, I'm pretty sure that there would be some investment that they would be willing to make. I, I personally would wait. And I know that their recruitment for those roles is like, um, in particular for folks that are not in the historic majority is pretty high. So yeah. Um, Kara. Yeah. For the government jobs that you were referencing earlier, where what's what's a good avenue to either like research those or um, I guess to find out where those openings are, as well as are those good for entry level people like us or is that something that probably is better for more experienced individuals? I would say it's good for entry level. Um, I, I struggle because like I don't really consider any of you all entry level. Like part of the digital literacy playbook right now from a workforce standpoint is really like, do you have folks that understand problem solving and like have good communication skills and can um, lead a team even if they're not the manager. And so like part of what was interesting when I originally talked to June was like, y'all are a talent pool that, that fits in this like very unique spot of having experience um, and just needing some support maybe from the coding language standpoint. Um, government is not like, you want it to all be consolidated. Like Dylan, I'd love to say, oh, you can just go to the state of Oregon's website mm -hmm. and you'll see all the jobs listed there. But unfortunately, that's not the reality of the world that we live in. And so it's really like based on the department. So like, I know that the Oregon Department of Agriculture hires their own jobs. I know that they are really heavily looking for data folks because of how many licenses and um, 
certificates you have to be get as a grower and we grow 270 crops here and so like they're having tons of folks that have to go through that data create stories around it um, i know that that pers so the retirement system they hire completely separately um, the Oregon lottery hires completely separately so if there's an area of interest, I would recommend going specifically to that department um, and seeing what their hiring looks like. And the other thing that's um, a challenge is as baby boomers retire, there is a big, big gap there um, for, the, for the government. Gotcha, well, thank you. Oh, county and city too also hire um, pretty regularly. Okay. Cool. Awesome. Um, would it be would it be something similar for um, like nonprofit organizations where just like find an area that you're interested in and um, do the research or? Yeah, and like. Um, Surprise! There's no centralized hub. There's no centralized, and that's another great question because like nonprofits also struggle to hire tech folks. Um, just the salaries are lower, just being a mm -hmm. nonprofit, but like. I know that um, I talked to Free Geek this morning, and I'm not sure if y'all are familiar with Free Geek, but they um, rebuild devices, get them into people's hands, and they've got a technical support team. But like they are hiring a, a digital inclusion manager, and they want somebody that um, has an interest in the digital divide, but also perhaps uh, has lived experience of not having access to the internet at, at some point. So um, yeah. And then there's like some really big nonprofits. Like there's a nonprofit called Central City Concern. Um, I think they're close to like 300 employees and the good chunk of them are uh, technologists. Um, they have a huge data team. Well, thank you. You're very welcome. What was the name of that last one you just said? Central City. Central City Concern. Yes. Oh, awesome. Thanks, Dustin. But I will I will tell you, like I um like that K-shape recovery is truly a tale of of two worlds right now between tech and non-tech. Um, we have organizations in this town that are thriving. Um, I'm not sure if anybody's heard of a company called um, Brand Live. Brand Live is, was literally about to shut their doors as an online event platform. And Lawrence, this could be interesting from a, a graphic standpoint. Um, and then they pivoted to do online events in a way that was really, really, really engaging. And then they wound up doing 50% of President-elect Biden's fundraising events and changing the narrative of what online political events look like. Um, they were concerned about backlash of being a company that was so supportive of one political party. So everything that was done, they skinned. So it just looked like the Biden-Harris team. Um, but they went from almost closing their doors pre-pandemic to now 120 people and hiring like every day. And I think that's, I wanted to drop this in the chat. I think that's the story that has me really inspired right now. And like what I love about my job, um, I'm putting the TAO link to our newsletter. Um, sign up, like that's where you'll get an update about our job board. Um, we have events like our, our member mix in two weeks, but like there's a company in uh, Beaverton called DAT Solutions, DAT Solutions. They are a supply chain logistics company. They've been in business for 40 years. And when COVID disrupted the supply chain, their software product became like one of the hottest sellers in the market. And they are hiring 30 people right now on their, on their tech team. And it's all levels. Um, like AWS is still on a hiring spree here. And I know not everyone wants a big company, um, but like the, the number of organizations that embarrassingly come to me and say we're doing so well I'm like no don't be embarrassed about it like 
like hire, hire young talent, like train people to do these jobs and like keep folks here in Oregon. So um, there's definitely a, a plethora of opportunities right now. I could talk forever. Zoom info, anybody in Vancouver, Washington, they're always hiring like a gajillion people and everything from customer success to, to development. Um, and they're a unicorn. So it's not often we get billion dollar IPOs. <laughs> out of our little corner of the world. If you go on to um, our general website as well, um, there's different resources there. Um, you can see our member companies. And that's what I always offer people when I do these conversations. If you go onto our website and you find a company that's a member um, and they have a job opening, I'm like always happy to connect folks. Um, that are looking. Um, our events are on there. Um, we have some like resources for individuals um, from like a discount standpoint. And then um, our blog uh, occasionally has some um, information around hiring. And we do a couple of hiring events per year. They're called Talent Match. So we'll do one in the first half of the year and one in the second half, but we don't have dates on those yet. But um, all those resources are available to you all. You all are technically considered members. Um, and I am here to support you in getting jobs and staying here and doing those jobs. Okay, go team. Kara, how do our students uh, access their membership? Oh, all they have to do is sign up for that newsletter and that's basically it they're then in the database as a member and we only send one newsletter a week as long as you don't click all the other newsletters that are available in that list if you click all of them i can't promise you how many emails you're going to get a lot great you tell us that now <laughs> don't don't click all of them Ron. just click like too late <laughs> um, you should have known <laughs> it's just like one um the other thing that you can do and it's basically how people consume information is follow us on linkedin or twitter those are like our primary like areas um where we post stuff and if any of you all are interested um we do a meet our member series and it would be cool to highlight a student particularly of one of our cold school partners um and in particular, like, I'm telling you, y'all are just like a group of unicorns. I'm like, people that are new into tech that have a ton of experience, like, yes, they exist. Because <laughs> yesterday I did this presentation for a bunch of juniors and seniors at Lewis and Clark, and I was like, why do they look so young? <laughs> I don't have anything else, June. That's it, unless people have questions. I mean, I have a plethora of information about workforce development. Um, I know there's tons of jobs out there and I do firmly believe that you all are the type of folks that are being looked for from a hiring standpoint. You know, um, a lot of the students that I, I have continued to work with, I've been certainly impressed with their background. Um, and then they get the technical skills. How how do you kind of start? Do you have any recommendations to a lot of a, a lot of folks I've talked to are just trying to get that entry level developer type of role, you know? And they have all this past experience. Do you have any guidance for yeah, our students? I always tell people like any kind of tech project you have in your portfolio, like whether it's setting up your photography website or something that you do as a volunteer. Um, organizations are always looking for people that from a volunteer perspective that can write some code. Um, I, my perspective is that um, the demand for having a robust technical skill set is not as relevant in many of these jobs as it once was. Um, I think organizations feel like that's much more teachable. And um, like, there's a book out right now called Mediocre and it's about how like networking, particularly in white culture has like created this level of mediocrity because we just hire people that we know. Um, and so I, I do truly believe that um, 
meeting people along the way and like saying, Hey, can you introduce me for this job? I mean, I, I almost always have folks at least do an informational interview if I refer somebody. So that's why I'm like, use me as a resource um, and use other people as resources too. Like the, um, it, it's until it changes, it is true that like sometimes who you know is really helpful. Um, and like I said, it's great that we recruit out of state talent, but I would prefer to give the jobs to the folks that are here now. Um, and sometimes it really is just literally coming to something that we're doing um, and, and meeting someone. Like we realize that this is challenging. And so we're gonna start doing a monthly, like I said, member mix where we're gonna use a software platform that literally uh, spins you through um, three to six people so you can meet one-on-one. -on -one. And like literally that conversation of, oh, this is the job I'm looking for. Like, don't be afraid to do that because in this community, like people are very, very willing because they have lots of job openings. That's great. And um, do you have any recommendations on like your volunteer partners on how maybe, you know, some, some of our students could reach out to get that experience? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, so the Hack Oregon one is one of, is a, our volunteer, um, is a partner opportunity. Um, sometimes we put those in our newsletter. We have a platform behind the firewall called Mobilize. Um, we post a lot of volunteer opportunities in that. And then we host four or five times a year. And we have one coming up in February, um, hackathons and or design sprints. And so one, it's a good way to be a, a mentor or judge or a participant. And um, if you join as a participant, we've had several, we actually had a team from um, another uh, boot camp that won our project um in june and all three of the women were looking to get hired and they basically like got to be highlighted before our community um as full stack developers who built a really cool app for a nonprofit. so we start on um we're doing an ag innovation um hackathon starting february 24th and going through march 3rd and the reason we do it over seven days is like people have jobs in school and parenting responsibilities. And so this allows you to kind of work when you can with your team. Um, so we'll do that. And then we'll do one that um, is uh, projects just specifically to support communities of color in May. And then um, one that's probably just general nonprofits in the late fall. And then we'll do a second ag innovation um, one in September. Great, thank you. Thank you. And you find out like all of these will be in our newsletters. I'm throwing in the link to the member mix in two weeks in case anybody wants to go. And I'm, I'm pumped because we're like using a brand new software that like no one in the market has used before. So it could be a disaster or it could be the greatest thing ever. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah. And I, like I said, I will, will repeat myself, like I'm always happy to facilitate an introduction. Thank you so much. You're Is welcome. Anybody, I, anybody? I have to add one more thing. I keep singing y'all's praises and I hadn't even met you yet. Um, I worked with, I talked to PGE um, and this is probably relevant, June, to answer your question. So I've been working with PGE about their talent pipeline from a tech perspective and um, utilities are a pretty, old industry um, and they're struggling as they move into their digital transformation. And so they realize that part of what they need to do is bring people in with like a, a one to three year career path so that as an entry level person from a, a coding standpoint, you're being given the support and the ability to grow um, and get paid to do it. So they're working on what that looks like. And I suggested you all as one of their organizations where they should be recruiting from. Thank you. It's great. Appreciate it. Gosh, I appreciate so much your support, uh, your information. Does anybody else, we have just a few more minutes. Any last questions for Kara? 
Don't be so talkative. <laughs> uh, yeah, I was just wondering if you have any advice on, um, you know, you say a lot of, there are a lot of people looking for, you know, people like us, but do you have any recommendations on how to market ourselves as people who, uh, you know, don't have a lot of experience necessarily in this field and just have, you know, what we learned in the boot camp, um, you know, especially compared to, you know, a lot, I see a lot of the, the um, a lot of job ad ads, you know, we're talking about like uh, wanting experience in terms of uh, like degrees or, you know, years in a, in an actual college environment. Like how would you, yeah. So how would you recommend kind of um, going in, you know, going into a, a uh, applying for a job with that kind of a, uh, expectation? You know, I think that's an unfair disadvantage to folks that are applying for jobs when job descriptions say that. Um, I, I would say in lieu of degrees, I have this experience. Um, and then it, it literally goes back to what I hear all the time. Like I need people with good communication skills or I need somebody that can do problem solving. Okay, so I maybe don't have five years of coding, but I've got relevant experience and it would add up to a, you know, bachelor's of arts degree and or this type of work experience. Um, I think the other thing that is interesting about folks that are like non-traditional entry level is um, because you tend to be further in life, like your responsibilities are different. And so like, play that up. Like I'm looking for this career. It's my second career. And in my first career, which I committed 27 years to, you know, I did X, Y, and Z. Um, I think that's really compelling, particularly in a super tight labor market like this from a tech standpoint where companies are just stealing from each other. So like, I think the ability to highlight how long you've done something else um, shows some commitment that companies find uh, really, um, it's expensive to hire and replace people. So like that's a, that's a value add. To, to go along with, oh, sorry, Joe. Uh, to go along with Joe's question, um, do, do you know of any like relevant like certifications, like an A plus certification, a Cisco network certification, or I, I mean, like the state of Oregon has like limited electrician certs and things like that. Do you think there would be anything worth applying for and going for to really give us a leg up? Uh, certificate, like I'm, I'm more interested in like if companies are going to be looking more at like micro credentialing and like, do you do a a six week project and that gives you um, some kind of um, experience level. I don't know of any, like for a long time, so I've done this a long time from a workforce standpoint and it used to be really critical that you have a, a Microsoft certification if you wanted to be a Microsoft developer. Um, I think that probably the hardware certifications are still a little bit more relevant. Um, the one thing that it does show is like that lifelong learner part of your personality, which again is like one of those 10 skills in this whole like digital literacy thing that folks wanna see. But I'm not hearing of any one type of certification or credential that is more important than the other. What I have heard is that the reliance on a four-year degree is unnecessarily exclusionary and that we should not be so hyper-focused on that. And I think in the Portland Metro, you're going to see that um, relevant experience in lieu of become more popular because like you're eliminating an entire super valuable candidates if a four-year degree or a certification is mandatory. Uh, thank you. Probably not the best answer because it's not super clear, but like we are encouraging folks to get away from that type of adherence. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Y'all are awesome. I'm going to stop and uh, stop the recording right now. And give me just a minute.